Good evening, Faith, Family, and Freedom group and friends and visitors and whomever. I'm so glad you're here with us tonight, and we are going to jump right in to Daniel chapter 6, which I've entitled The Lion Chow, and you'll find out in a minute if you're not familiar with this passage in the scriptures. But when you jump in, if you wouldn't mind, I would appreciate if you'd say hello so we know who's here um, and we can greet one another. I'm going to be reading, so I won't be able to pay attention to the chat while I read, but I will say hello um, afterwards or during the, the, the message tonight. So thanks again for coming, and we're going to jump right into Daniel chapter 6, and I'm going to be reading from the message translation since it's pretty easy to understand. And uh, so here we go. Daniel chapter 6. So we have a new king. At the end of chapter 5, remember the previous king was got whacked, and Darius from the Medes and the Persians is now the king. So Darius reorganized his kingdom. He appointed 120 governors to administer all the parts of his realm. Over them were three vice regents, one of whom was Daniel. Interesting, huh? The governors reported to the vice regents, who made sure that everything was in order for the king. But Daniel brimming with spirit and intelligence, so completely outclassed the other vice regents and governors that the king decided to put him in charge of the whole kingdom. Well, the vice regents and the governors got together to find some old scandal or skeleton in Daniel's life that they could use against him, but they couldn't dig up anything. He was totally exemplary and trustworthy. They could find no evidence of negligence or misconduct, so they finally gave up and they said, hmm, we're never going to find anything against Daniel unless we can scheme up something religious. The vice regents and the governors conspired together, and then they went to the king and said, King Darius, long live forever. We've convened your vice regents, governors, and all of your leading officials, except for Daniel, and have agreed that the king should issue the following decree. For the next 30 days, no one is to pray to any god or mortal except you, O king. And anyone who disobeys will be thrown into the lion's den. Issue this decree, O king, and make it unconditional, as if written in stone like all the laws of the Medes and the Persians. King Darius signed the decree. When Daniel learned that the decree had been signed and posted, he continued to pray, just as he had always done. His house had windows in the upstairs that opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he knelt there in prayer, thanking and praising God. Well, the conspirators came and found him praying, asking God for help. Then they went straight to the king and reminded him of the royal decree that he had signed. Did you not, they said, sign a decree forbidding anyone to pray to any god or man except you for the next 30 days, and anyone caught doing it would be thrown into the lion's den? Absolutely, said the king, written in stone like all the laws of the Medes and the Persians. Then they said, well, Daniel, one of the Jewish exiles, ignores you, O king, and defies your decree. Three times a day, he prays. At this, the king was very upset, and he tried his best to get Daniel out of the fix he'd put him in. He worked at it the whole day long. But then the conspirators were back. Remember, O king, it's the law of the Medes and the Persians that the king's decree can never be changed. You can just imagine how smugly they said that. The king caved in and ordered Daniel brought and thrown into the lion's den. But he said to Daniel, your God, to whom you are so loyal, is going to get you out of this. A stone slab was placed over the opening of the den. The king sealed the cover with a signet ring and the signet rings of all of his nobles, fixing Daniel's fate. Then the king went back to his palace. He refused supper. He couldn't sleep. He spent the night fasting. At daybreak, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. As he approached the den, he called out anxiously, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve so loyally, saved you from the lions? O king, live forever, said Daniel. My God sent his angel, who closed the mouth of the lions, so that they would not hurt me. I've been found innocent before God, and also before you, O king. I've done nothing to harm you. When the king heard these words, he was happy. He ordered Daniel taken up out of the den. 
And when he was hauled up, there wasn't a scratch on him. He had trusted his God. Then the king commanded that the conspirators who had informed on Daniel be thrown into the lion's den along with their wives and children. And before they hit the floor, the lions had them in their jaws, tearing them to pieces. Gross. King Darius then published this proclamation to every race, color, and creed on earth. Peace to you, abundant peace. I decree that Daniel's God shall be worshipped and feared in all parts of my kingdom. He is the living God, world without end. His kingdom never fails. His rule continues eternally. He is a savior and a rescuer. He performs astonishing miracles in heaven and on earth. He saved Daniel from the power of the lions. And then lastly, verse 28. From then on, Daniel was treated well during the reign of Darius and also in the following reign of Cyrus the Persian. So that, my friends, is Daniel chapter 6. Let me pop back and see if anybody's here. I see Jim and Joanne and Mel. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> Jim is roaring to go. Funny. Ha ha ha. You're hilarious. So, this is quite an exciting chapter. And if you have spent any time in the church as a child, you probably know the story of Daniel and the lion's den. But most of the time, it's just about Daniel. Daniel got caught doing what he always did, which was pray to God, and the wise guys set a trap for him, which the king fell into, and Daniel got tossed in the den, but he survived. And that's pretty much the children's version of the story. But there's so much more in this. I hope I'm going to have time to get through it all. I'll do my very, very best. But I want to encourage you, if you've never studied this chapter and looked up um, other sermons about it or read through... Um, what's the word, I can't think of the word, of uh, concordances or uh, study notes about it. There's so much to unpack in here. I'm going to share some notes that I uh, gleaned from uh, a sermon that Alistair Begg gave, and I love him. I love his Scottish accent, but he reminds us that at this point in time, so King Darius is the third king that Daniel has served. So he's about in his 70s at this point. He's not a young guy anymore, but he has served faithfully since he was brought to Babylon as a captive when he was a boy, probably a teenager. And even though Darius came in, he, he whacked the previous king, and normally when a king comes into a new kingdom, he's going to appoint all his own guys. Like he's, you know, he wants people he can trust. And here stands Daniel, who had just been given this purple robe and this gold chain because the previous king had trusted him. And Darius was wise enough to recognize that Daniel was worth trusting. So he put Daniel in the, the trifold of guys who were in charge of all the rest of the governors. But once again, Daniel was so faithful in his service and so good at his job and so trustworthy that the king was about to put him in charge of everybody, not just in charge of 120 governors, along with two other helper, helper dudes, leaders, but he was going to be in charge of the whole kingdom. Most we well know the king's wise guys. Now, we don't know how many of them that are current wise guys were wise guys from previous administrations. Since a lot of them were like magicians and sorcerer type of dudes, Darius may have kept some of them on. But regardless, jealousy was at an all-time high. As Alist Alistair shared, you know, there's nothing more annoying than a punctual co-worker when you're used to coming in late. <laughs> so they didn't like the fact that Daniel was trustworthy and honorable, and he really never did anything wrong in front of the king. He, I mean, his life was perfect. He was the same guy in front of the king and in the palace as he was in his personal life. And the word for that is integrity. We get that in mathematical terms, integer, integral, one, one and the same. There's no separation. There's no you're one way at church on Sunday morning, and you're another way when you're driving home or on Monday when you wake up and go to work. Integrity means being the same person and being true to that everywhere you are, every day, no matter what. And that is who Daniel was. And so the wise guys hated him because he made them look bad, right? So what do they do? They were very clever. First, they tried to look for 
things that Daniel had done wrong. They were looking for skeletons in his closet, things that they could use to accuse him before the king, to say, you can't trust this guy. But they couldn't find anything. I wonder how many of us that would be true. I suspect hmm, somewhere around zero, myself included. But Daniel, he was an amazing servant of Almighty God, and they couldn't find anything bad to say about him. Oh, that that would be true for us, right? It's a goal. So when they realized that there was no bad stuff that they could dig up, no dirt they could dig up on Daniel, they came up with an extremely clever plan. They realized that the only way we're going to get this dude out of the picture is if we use his religion against him. In other words, we figure out a way to make what he does all the time something wrong in the eyes of the king. But they knew they couldn't be super straightforward about it because King Darius thought extremely highly of Daniel. However, as kings tend to be, he was still a prideful, somewhat arrogant person. So when the wise guys came to him with this proposition, oh king, for the next 30 days, and it's kind of clever that they only made it 30 days long, so if the king had any objections, they could say, oh, it's only for 30 days. But the king didn't. Anyways, oh king, for the next 30 days, make it illegal for anybody to pray to anyone or anything other than you. They fed the king's ego, which is a very clever tactic that Satan uses a lot, feeding our ego. Oh, you're going to look so good if you do that. It doesn't matter if it's not really the right, you know, it's not completely on the up and up. You're going to look so good when it's all said and done. You can fix it later. No. But that is how they got the king to sign this decree. Now, you kind of wonder, when the king thought so highly of Daniel, and these, his wise guys come to him with this proposition. You kind of wonder why the king didn't recognize that Daniel wasn't there. But he was so overcome by his own puffed up image of himself and the fact that they were now going to make him the person that everyone prayed to for the next 30 days. So he signed it. Not only did he sign it, but he put his seal on it. Now, in those days, it wasn't like it is today where you can... Somebody can write a law, a president comes into power, and he writes a thing, and he signs a thing, and then he's out of power, and then the next president says, eh, we're not gonna, we're not gonna agree to that thing anymore, because now I'm the dude in charge. No. Once the law was written and sealed, it could not be changed, even by the one who wrote it. So when Darius sealed it, he didn't realize what he had done, what he had done initially. So the wise guys toddled off to where they could see Daniel, because they knew that he was going to do exactly what he had done every day. And that was to pray in his window, which faced Jerusalem, to pray morning, noon, and night. He prayed three times a day. He prayed before he went to work, he came home for lunch and prayed, and he prayed at the end of the day, like clockwork. An easy pray, right? It was easy to catch him doing what he always did, even though the law had now been written. And Daniel knew that the law had been written, that it was going to become punishable by death. And not just any death, but a really gruesome, horrific, and gross death. I don't know why kings had dens of lions. I really have no clue. But from my research, it, it looked like they would carve out these dens in, in cave-like structures that had sort of a vertical mouth to it. So the lions couldn't easily get out, and if they wanted to feed them, they just basically opened the trap door and tossed in the food and slammed it shut. But this also made it so that when they had the king had somebody to punish, they could open the trap door and toss the person or persons in. Now imagine this 80-year-old man going into the... Yikes. So anyways, so here's Daniel. He's praying, as he would, as he continued to do. He continued to faithfully pray to God. And what was he praying? He was praying with thanksgiving. He was praying and giving thanks to God and asking God for help, just like he did every single day. Do we do that? Do you? I hope so, because God certainly deserves it. We are told to pray without ceasing. But I do believe that there are. we are also called upon not just to have our ongoing conversation with God, 
but to have some dedicated, if you if you will, war room type of praying where you set yourself aside by yourself and pray very specifically and, and concentratedly, if that's what the word, dedicated time frame for praying to God. And that's what Daniel did. So they caught him. And then they went to the king. Now, they didn't drag Daniel with them, oddly enough. I'm not quite sure what they did with him. The scripture doesn't say. But the wise guys, now that they knew that they had Daniel, he was caught in the act. There were witnesses. They went to the king. Oh, king, didn't you sign this decree? Yes. Well, one of those people that you brought, that were brought in from Judea, notice one of them, has defied your laws, has defied your decree. He's not honoring you the way that you deserve to be honored. And you said that if anybody did that during this 30 days, that he would be thrown into the lion's den, right? Well, what could the king say? I mean, he'd signed the thing. He'd signed the deal. He'd sealed it. And then they told him who it was. And his heart sank. You see, because Darius thought very highly of Daniel. Obviously, he was going to put him in charge of the whole deal. But the funny thing is, that's not something that Alistair Begg pointed out that I wanted to, that I wanted to share here. It's maybe not the most timely spot, but he made a comment. This is Alistair Begg, who was a pastor, that pluralism can only accept other pluralists. What does that mean? So a pluralist is somebody who believes in lots of different things, lots of different gods, just like the wise guys did. They believed in sorcery and witchcraft and all these, like we talked about last week, idols of stone and wood and brass and gold and silver. So, but a pluralist says, oh, as long as you, you know, yeah, you believe in what you want, that's, that's cool. Unless you believe in Jehovah God. That's why the Judeo-Christian belief is so highly persecuted. Because the pluralists can't stand that anybody would have the audacity to say that there is only one true God. And that's exactly what Daniel was purporting. And who he worshipped was the one true God. And he was honoring to that God. And that just irritated the daylights out of the wise guys and the rest of the world. Absolute truth seems to fly in the face of most cultures on the earth. So because Daniel was relentlessly persistent in his daily practices, he was easy to catch. Well, as I mentioned, Darius was distraught. He tried everything. He tried all day, looking at the laws and trying to figure out ways to get Daniel out of the pickle he put him in, because he knew that it was his fault. Daniel hadn't done anything wrong. Well, he had. He'd broken the law. Which brings me to another point. If there is a law that defies the law of God, what do we do as believers in Jehovah God? I believe this is pretty clear. We honor God which is exactly what Daniel did. That doesn't mean, however, comma, that doing the right thing will prevent us from being punished by the wrong people. Hmm. Well, Darius tried all day to find a way out. He tried to find a loophole. Is there any way, like, can I scrape my little wax signet ring off? No, there's too many witnesses. There's nothing he can do. So at the end of the day, when it was sundown, he finally said, I give up. The law is the law. I'm the king. We have to throw Daniel into the lion's den, just like we said. So they got Daniel, and they brought him to the lion's den. But as they tossed this 80-year-old man into this den full of hungry, wild, growling beasts, Darius's last words were, May your king save you. May your God, whom you serve, save you. Darius was beginning, I think, to have faith in Daniel's God. And he was putting him to the test. Well, Daniel's now in the lion's den by himself. Hungry, ravenous beasts. You know, they're called the king of the king of the jungle, even though they don't really live in the jungle. They live in the Saharas, but mostly. But they are ferocious and very powerful creatures. And Daniel was left with them all alone, all night. Meanwhile, Darius, the king, goes back to his boudoir and his minions bring him dinner and he's like, I can't eat. There's no way I can eat. Take it away. 
He lay down to try to sleep and he couldn't sleep. He was up all night fasting and it doesn't say he was praying, but I think in his own way, he probably was trying to. It just said that he was up all night fasting. So in the morning, as soon as it was daylight, he ran to the lion's den and he flew open, had them open up the gate. Daniel, Daniel, did your God protect you? And then he waited. And Daniel calls out, oh, king, my God sent an angel who closed the mouths of the lion. I am unharmed. My God saved me. And the king, get him out of there. Picture that. You're an 80-year-old person who has done nothing wrong in the eyes of God, only has done something wrong in the eyes of evil men, and you were being punished for it. And you pray to God, and God sends his angels. These, the angel turned these beasts, God's angel turned God's created beasts into a room full of kitty cats. I know lions purr. I've heard it, seen it on video. I'm not personally, but I believe those lions were just chillaxing with Daniel all night. He may even use one of them as a pillow. Who knows? But they did not harm a hair of his head or an inch of his skin. He had no, when they pulled him out, he had no claw marks. He had no stains. He had no injuries. Nothing. He was perfectly whole and probably well rested because he knew that the angel of, the God was prote angel of God was protecting him. What happens next is gruesome, but just. The king takes all those wise guys who conspired against Daniel and their families and throws them to these now super ravenous beasts and they are chomped down. They become the lion chow. So I did this lion chow. They, they thought they were making Daniel Lion Chow, but they became Lion Chow. And it wasn't in a bag from Purina, right? Gross. But the best part of the story is what happens next. King Darius now issues this royal decree telling everybody, every race, every color, every creed, you are now to worship the Almighty God, Jehovah God, whom Daniel worships, because now we know that he is, in fact, the one true God. There is none like him. He basically was singing like a river glorious, if you will. <laughs> Alistair brought that up as well. And that never would have happened, would it? If Daniel had decided, well, what are the things he could have done? He could have said, well, yeah, I'll keep praying, but I'm going to do it quietly, and I'm going to do it in secret. And no one's ever going to know. I'm still going to pray to God. I'm still going to worship God. But I'm going to do it secretly so that I don't get caught. No. He did it openly. The way he had always done. This wasn't about him making a big stand. Like, like, one, like he now decided, oh, I'm going to do all that. I'm going to prove. I'm going to get in the face of the king and I'm just going to defy him. Because I don't want to do what he says. No. He continued to do what he had been doing, the way he had been doing it, honoring God, publicly, in a way where anybody who wanted could see him. So where's the lesson there? What is the lesson in that? What's the lesson in that for us? When we are called upon, or we are put in a position where we are challenged, or maybe even accused, are told that we can't do what God has told us we must do. Our faithfulness in doing the right thing, the things that God has told us to do, being faithful in the face of fear and potential judgment or torture or punishment, whatever, losing your job, whatever. When we are faithful, we encourage others to also be faithful. You know, not everybody has great strength. There are people who want to be faithful, but they haven't had the experiences to build up that faith muscle. Faith muscle. Ooh, that's hard to say. Faith muscle, like some others. So when we who have been through that 
are able to demonstrate and continue to display, not in a prideful or haughty way, not in a self-righteous, self-declarative, ooh, look at me, aren't I amazing because I'm so great? No, but we faithfully continue to serve God. That is a testimony and a witness, just like Hebrews 12 says, surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us run the race, not only for the prize, but that those who come before us would see, see, see ugh, those who come before us would see that we were faithful and that they would also be faithful. I'm having a hard time talking tonight. Oh, sorry about that. Here's another question. Have you, have any of you ever been punished for honoring God? It's kind of a rare thing in this country, but I believe that the time is coming and perhaps already is where that is going to be more and more prevalent. Where when we choose to do things that honor God and doing the right things, we are maybe not thrown into a lion's den, but we are ridiculed, made fun of, kicked out of a popular group at school or at work, or even among our family, if our family members don't believe as we do. Why do you suppose that God allowed Daniel to be pitched into the lion's den when he was just doing God's will? Does God always rescue his servants from harm? Why not? I know we're getting, we're getting close to the end of time, but I want to encourage you to look at Acts chapter 7. I'm not going to read through it now, but it's the story of Stephen, who was a follower of Christ in the New Testament, and he had just delivered this long, amazing sermon to the Sanhedrin and the Jewish leadership. This is after Christ has already been crucified, dead, buried, resurrected, and ascended. But Stephen lays out, goes through the scriptures from start to finish, and explains to the people who Christ was and God's plan of salvation from the beginning of time until then. And then he turns around and he says, and you, pointing at the religious leaders, you had the inside scoop to all of these scriptures, you saw what was being fulfilled, and yet you crucified the Messiah. And the leadership there were very angry. They started hissing and gnashing their teeth, and they snatched him up, and they dragged him out of the city, and they stoned him to death. But what happened? If you'll look at the end, I'm just going to read the very end of Acts chapter 7. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, hardly noticed he only had eyes for God, whom he saw in all of his glory, with Jesus standing at his side. Stephen said, I see heaven opening, and the Son of Man standing at God's side. Yelling and hissing, the mob drowned him out. Now in a full stampede, they dragged him out of town and pelted him with rocks. The ringleaders took off their coats and asked a young man named Saul to watch them. As the rocks rained down, Stephen prayed, Master, Jesus, take my life. Then he knelt down, praying loud enough for everyone to hear. Master, don't blame them for this sin. His last words. And then he died. And Saul was right there, congratulating the killers. So here we see an instance where somebody who was a believer did the right thing, preached the gospel, and was killed. But the end result in both cases, both for what happened to Daniel, he was thrown in a lion's den, but his life was spared and he wasn't injured. Stephen was stoned to death. But in both cases, God used that situation because of their faithfulness to protect them in a way. Now, Daniel's protection was physical. Stephen's protection was mental, emotional, spiritual. His physical body died, but he knew where he was going. He knew that Christ was going to receive him, and he didn't care how he died. I just, um, this past weekend, uh, participated in a memorial service for my college roommate and dear friend of the past 43 years, and she battled cancer for 21 years. 21 years. Now, she was a believer, and the last week of her life was very, very difficult for her. Struggling to breathe. Um, machines that were so loud she couldn't hear herself think in a hospital room. And so we were texting back and forth and you know, like, how are you doing? How can we encourage you? And she said, it's okay. I have some cheery hymns running through my head. Really? What are they? 
Victory in Jesus, great is thy faithfulness, were two of the ones. It is well with my soul was another one. She had a whole litany of Christian hymns playing. She was a musician as well, playing in her head to encourage her heart. So when that time came on the 24th of July, when she took her last breath, and she entered into her eternal reward, she went with a heart knowing that even though her body was not going to survive, her spirit would. And I hope and pray that everyone here has that same assurance. First Corinthians tells us, for now we see in a mirror dimly, like a foggy, poorly silvered mirror, but then we will see face to face, for now we know in part, but then we will know fully, just as we are fully known. Isn't that an amazing promise to hold on to? So even if you find yourself in a situation like Daniel, where you're doing the right thing, and you're still getting tossed into the lion's den, you're still getting fired from your job, or you're not getting the promotion that you deserve because you are honoring God, because you are honoring God, make sure it may be clear on that. When we choose to be true, yes, exactly, Julian, when we are true to our Heavenly Father, he is true to us. The last verse of this um, hymn, Like a River Glorious, Every joy or trial falleth from above, traced upon our dial by the Son of Love. We may trust him fully, all for us to do. They who trust him wholly find him wholly true. I'm going to post a video of that hymn after we're done. I'm afraid of copyright issues here, but you can all listen to it on your own. I want to encourage you just to listen to this amazing hymn. I'm probably going to be singing it in my head all night. But thank you so much for joining us, and I hope you learned something new through this story of Daniel and the lion. Daniel, oh, Daniel in the lion's den. Daniel was faithful, and so was God, and he'll do the same for you. Father God, thank you so very much for the opportunity that we have to gather freely every week here in this group, that we are not currently, at least, under any kind of religious persecution that would prevent us from gathering together and worshiping you and learning from your word about how you, through the ages, have protected your servants. Lord, I just ask that you would give us the grace and the strength and the courage to be like Daniel and like Stephen and like Paul, who Saul eventually became. Give us courage to do what we know we are to do to honor you. And we thank you that you will then fulfill your promise to us that where you are, we will one day also be. I just ask that you would go with each one of these blessed friends here in this group, those who are watching tonight, those who will watch later on uh, the recording, either here on Facebook or on YouTube, just ask that you would speak to their hearts, that you would encourage them, you would empower them, and that we might always trust you fully and find that you are wholly true. Thank you for this time together. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. Thank you so very much for joining us tonight, and I hope that you have a wonderful week ahead. And we have a praise in our family. Mel's wheelchair is going to be fixed tomorrow. He's going to get his regular wheelchair back. So thank you for those of you who have been praying for that. Praise God. And I hope you all have a wonderful week ahead. Take care and God bless.